All right. All right, Mr. Nita. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Nita, we'll do the roll call. Can I check this is correct? Okay. Yeah, that was that was me. Nailed it. Need to... Ready for roll call? Yep. Come in. Council Member King? Here. Council Member Moreno? Present. Council Member Jeruso? Here. Council Member Morrell? Council Member Harris? We have a quorum. All right, thank you. Um, this is the first community development meeting for 2023. At this time, I make a motion to accept the, the approve the minutes from last meeting. Second meeting, I'm sorry, this is our second meeting. Motion made, sent by Council Member Moreno. For, fa for in favor, minutes approved. And this time I'm going to go out of order just a little bit and have uh, Council Member Moreno present her ordinance. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman King. The uh, ordinance that we will uh, discuss right now is uh, Ordinance Calendar 34023. It is dealing with chronic nuisance properties, uh, harboring crime. And, and, and let me just speak generally as to why I thought that this uh, ordinance was uh, important as we try to figure out different solutions um, and different tools uh, to deal with very serious and violent crime in, in, in our city. I think it's important to take a look at what other cities are using as tools and solutions. And so in doing research, uh, there has been a work around uh, nuisance ordinances targeting uh, businesses that are harboring serious crime. And, and one of those cities that does have an ordinance similar to this one is actually uh, in Baltimore. So you can go to the first um, slide, please. So, uh, and, and, and actually council member Harrison, I just actually met with uh, chief Harrison in Baltimore just a, a few days ago and discussed this with him um, as well. So really what we were looking to do is, and the overall purpose of this ordinance is to target the most severe uh, violators for very serious offenses. And we wanted to make sure that as, as we did this, that we created very clear rules for enforcement and that there was also uh, a, a very strong uh, due process uh, element of the ordinance, because if you lack in that, uh, that in my opinion would have been problematic. So we were able to find a path and I'll go into that. Uh, obviously, we needed to set the penalties uh, for prohibiting business operations, and we also set civil penalties as well. And as I had just mentioned, this was modeled after legislation in other cities, including Baltimore's padlock laws. I want to make very clear that this is not targeting any specific business or any specific type of business. Uh, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of uh, discussion in um, in media articles about another resolution dealing with ATC and bars. Like, I wanna make sure that, that, that there's clear understanding that this particular ordinance is not targeting any specific type of business. I mean, this could be, uh, and I'm just throwing out all random types of examples, not targeting anyone, but this could be a hotel. It could be a mechanic shop. It could be a, a, a variety of, of different things. It could be a convenience store. Uh, so I just wanted to make that very clear that this isn't targeting any type of specific business or any specific type of businesses. Um, so with that, with the conversation that we had with Chief uh, Harrison in Baltimore, I thought it was really interesting that what he what he told Council Member Harris and I was that just having the padlock law when there are issues and he can actually you know, go to a specific business and say, you are now qualifying under this nuisance ordinance, that, that, that it's very rare that anyone actually gets shut down. That just the, the initial contact from the chief and the meeting with the chief and his team to come up with an abatement plan 
usually ends up solving the problem. So I think that that is also like a really key and important piece here that it's not about like trying to shut down businesses. It's about trying to come up with solutions when there are serious issues occurring in businesses or, um, uh, or, or right in, in their property. I should say that there is a, a specific strong action that can be taken to rectify those plans. So let me get into the, the, the specific details of the ordinance. All right, so what is a chronic nuisance property? Defined under this particular ordinance, to qualify as a chronic nuisance property, it means that the property needs to be used on three separate occasions within a one-year period for, one, distributing, administering, storing, or drug manufacturing, storage or possession of stolen property or unregistered firearms, the furtherance of a crime of violence as defined in Louisiana Revised Statutes 14.2 and or criminal gang offenses. And if you take a look at the um, Louisiana Crime of Violence Statutes, you'll notice that yes, of course, these are incredibly serious crimes, many of them uh, very violent offenses. All right, so the penalty for violators. The violator shall not possess an occupational license for a period of up to two years. And it, that's really depending on the severity of the violations. And they shall also face civil penalties, court costs, and $500 a day penalties to be assessed from the date of notice received. So let me walk everyone now through the procedure of enforcement because I think this is such a key piece, the enforcement piece and also how the process is going to work. So, it starts with the superintendent. So if the superintendent of police receives documentation of a suspected chronic nuisance property, the chief will then review uh, this particular information and make that determination on whether it does fit the definition of a chronic nuisance property under this ordinance. So for the properties that do meet this criteria, the superintendent then notifies the owner in writing that the property is in danger of being declared a chronic nuisance property and that, it, that, that there is to be a meeting to be set between the superintendent, her team, uh, and the property owner. Now, the property owner is to respond within 10 days of receiving the official notice. We have uh, things that need to be put into the notice, including the address of the property, uh, description of the nuisance activities, uh, and uh, and of course, the statement also describing the, the different penalties. So all of that is to be outlined in the notice piece. So if the if the owner responds timely and and sits down with the superintendent and her team and, and says, yes, let me figure out how to work through uh, an abatement program, the chief and her team, along with the property owner, can work out a timeline and a course of action for remediation. All right, here's to where we get to the to the the, the stronger enforcement, and then also to the potentially to the potential of padlocking the business. If the owner fails to respond to the notice or abate the property, the matter is then referred to the city attorney for further action. <clears throat> Once the properties are referred to the city attorney on civil court action, here's what happens. The city attorney uh, will take a look at, um, at, at what has been referred to her uh, by the chief, and she will then move forward with going to civil district court and, uh, and, and starting the process of potential penalties and the closure of the properties. So the city attorney may initiate legal action, which may include prohibition of business operations, civil penalties and court costs, as I've mentioned. Now, I wanna mention this because it's important, but the city shall have the burden of proof to show by a preponderance of evidence that the property is a chronic nuisance. Evidence may include police reports, affidavits outlining, or affidavits outlining information that led to arrests or nuisance activity occurring in the site. If the court determines that a property qualifies as a chronic nuisance, it may order the property closed, direct the city to physically secure, secure the premises and initiate additional uh, financial penalties. So the, the court action is what I think is, is so important because unlike other cities here in New Orleans, we really don't have administrative uh, hearings. Uh, other cities 
what they do is the, they'll have a, a meeting with the chief of police or they'll have some type of city administrative hearing around this, but we're really not set up that way. So how, uh, how could we do it here in New Orleans, but also ensure that there was uh, some type of uh, judicial proceeding where we made sure that the property owner was afforded all of the rights possible to defend themselves. Um, yet at the same time, we also wanted to make sure that we had judicial proceedings that we could move very quickly uh, with. And so going through the city attorney immediately taking these actions and going through CDC and having uh, the, the judge there expeditiously rule on these matters, I think uh, is, is a very smart way to go about this that I'm not gonna take credit for it. It's gonna, it was our executive counsel, Adam Swensick that came up with these um, procedures. So that's what the ordinance does. I know that I, I, I went through a lot of different specifics about it, but I'm happy to take any questions and um, break it down. I know that the law department did have a couple of questions um, about, you know, whether or not uh, they would, whether or not we really could take back permits. And Adam, you know what, I'll have you talk about that and, and your, your bit of disagreement um, with the law department on that, just so that we put everything everything out there. And of course, I'm always happy to handle any amendments if necessary. Adam? Certainly. There's a there's a body of case law that uh, prohibits a city department from withholding a permit. If, if criteria that are set forth in statutes, if they're satisfied, if they're met, uh, there's a whole bundle of cases in case law that say that we can't, at, at an administrative, at a departmental level, impose requirements or deny permits if someone otherwise meets the face of the requirements set forth in the law. Here, this is a little bit different because we are, as the council writes the law, so we are establishing what constitutes a nuisance and, and where it, I think this is very, where this differs from other cases, we, we have court intervention. And so, the, the criteria for the nuisance are set forth in the law. The city attorney has to go to court, get them a, to agree, prove the requirements for an injunction. And at that point, the civil court steps in, issues an order. And, and you know, from my perspective legally, that gives a, a substantial level of due process uh, that didn't exist in the cases that where, you know, the, the court has held you can't deny a, an occupational license under these circumstances. Thank you, Adam. And I do have a set of amendments that I just want to uh, uh, talk about. <clears throat> we found a little bit of a loophole in the ordinance, the way that it was written, that you know someone could be going through uh, the uh, procedures and potentially, uh, uh, eventually, I should say, uh, padlocked. But we 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 determined that the way that the ordinance was written, that if someone sold the property or transferred ownership, and now the property was under a new LLC, that potentially they could just continue operations and have the, the property uh, reopened. So one of the amendments, what Adam determined uh, that we should do is that the chronic nuisance property judgments that they run with the land, don't run with the business, business ownership, they run with the land. So that's one uh, amendment that I have. And the other piece, actually a very good amendment here brought to me by housing advocates is we wanted to make very clear that this ordinance is about uh, nuisance, nuisance businesses harboring uh, crime, uh, nuisance properties, but we do not mean uh, residential properties. And, and, and I think the issue that was being brought to us by housing advocates is you could have a situation where maybe there's an, a, an apartment complex, for example, where there could have been um, instances of domestic, uh, aggravated domestic abuse battery, which is a crime of violence. Um, and because of that, if there were several instances of that, then you could have the whole residential apartment complex shut down. Okay. That is absolutely not our intent. Um, our intent is to go after businesses that may be storing illegal weapons, storing, storing sto stolen uh, property. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, very serious uh, types of offenses um, that they are uh, 
somehow harboring these particular uh, crimes. We're certainly not trying to shut down any type of, of, of residences. So the second amendment that I have, it says the provisions of this article and the prohibitions in the section shall not apply to residential properties, apartment complex, or any other property used exclusively for residential purposes. Um, and so those are my sets of amendments. Council Member Jeruso, I see you've got questions or comments. Yeah, um, I have one question and then a related comment, which is in the part about where this goes, it says um, court of competent jurisdiction. And I just want to make sure that we're meaning courts because there are um, administrative hearings when it comes to code enforcement, safety and permits. And I don't know if the intent is to make it so that there's parallel jurisdiction as with many matters to both, or if the intent is for this to be a municipal court instead. It's not municipal court, it's civil district court. Do you think I need a, a more specific amendment, Adam? I'd like to take a look at it after the meeting. Uh, the, the intent is certainly for this to happen in a court of law, not for it to be an administrative proceeding, but but I, I will look at that that language and come up with some amendments to allay the concern. All right, I, I appreciate that because I think as what I, I think what I worry about is we've seen the administrative proceeding process for a long time and we always hear there aren't enough people or this is a problem. And I also think somebody wearing a robe is in a better position no, you are a hundred percent right. And and to tell you the truth, we are actually not even set up to handle something of this magnitude through the administrative um, proce procedures process. Um, and so that's why we knew that actually putting it through CDC would be the best approach. And to your po point, uh, Council Member Jeruso, that the, yes, then you would have a, a, a also a final determination from a judge in a court of law. Yeah, I think I think that's good. Um, and then the only other thing is, of course, I support this that um, we hope uh, to have soon code enforcement as its own department done the way that council member Morrell has, has urged it to be done. Um, I will, if I need to, I will offer an ordinance to put it on the ballot in time for October. But my understanding from the administration is that they will issue an executive order and then the council will vote on that in the near term. And I think that goes hand in glove with exactly this, this effort that you're putting forward. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Public comment, Anita? No. So Chief Woodfork is in a meeting, but she wanted to come uh, down and speak uh, in support of this uh, ordinance. Uh, you know what we can do, um, Chairman King? What we can do is we can go ahead and, and vote on this to send it to the, to the full council. And maybe when she is able to come down, if she could just have a quick second um, to just speak briefly. And, uh, she wanted to be here right at 10, but she was delayed, unfortunately. Okay, so I will make a motion to approve. Seconded by Council Member King. It's five yeas, no nays with Council Member Morrell's machine not working. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you. Now we're gonna move to presentation as item number, num item number three, and that is presentations from our community businesses. So I know we, we invited a few to come down today through different reasons. Everyone, everyone wasn't able to make it. So for those who are able to come, come sit down. We're going to have, come sit down at the table at the front. For now, I just minimize our presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You got this? Click here, here, or you can click here. Or I can do it if you do. All right, so a couple of months ago, I was talking to a small business owner in the city and they uh, a little bit frustrated because they say that, you know, our city doesn't do a good job of promoting the, the local talent that we have. We often reach outside of our city, outside of our parish, outside of our state to um, 
promote other businesses and to cast a, a good light on other businesses. So I thought that uh, as a council, we should quarterly, at least quarterly, um, have local businesses come in, promote themselves and see how, as, how can we as a council, as a city as a whole, help cultivate some of our local talent. But we have a lot of talent throughout the city. It's a shame that it doesn't always get shown in the light it deserves to be shown in. So with, with that, I'm going to stop talking and, and let the uh, the panel go from my right to their left, their left to to their right, and um, in your own way, present who you are, what you what you're about. Uh, kind of consider this as a, a bit of an infomercial on on your business. So hopefully, um, people watching can see. Um, I know Mardi Gras is coming up with the biggest free party in the world. Um, and hopefully we can help promote some of our local business, not just um, not doing Mardi Gras, but, but year round. So uh, Ms. Williams, you, you have the floor and start the presentation. Good morning, members of the council. I'm Council Member King. Thank you for the opportunity to share the work of um, our various organizations. And thank you, Council Member Jeruso, for the invitation to talk about Center for Resilience. My name is Liz Marcel Williams. I'm the founder and the director of Center for Resilience. Um, so essentially, we are the only therapeutic day program in the state um, for children with significant emotional health needs. And we opened our doors in 2015 in response to needs that were being articulated primarily through the school system. So um, with the gradual shutdown of a lot of the state-run programs, including the New Orleans Adolescent Hospital, schools were really feeling the stress of a lack of appropriate mental health services for children with the most clinically significant needs. Um, so I have a little bit of the data, um, both nationally and locally, um, about children with mental and behavioral health needs that haven't really changed over uh, the course of our existence. Existence, but we know that one in five children suffers from a mental health need nationally, um, and that incidence rates of autism are on the rise, both locally and nationally. Um, certainly, we're all familiar with the incidence rates of post-traumatic stress disorder among youth in the city. Um, most studies estimate that to be at about 60%. Um, and there's another piece of compelling data, which is when you look at kids with disabilities nationally, about 10% of children with behavior disabilities are served in separate, um, intentionally designed alternative settings. In Louisiana, it's less than 1%. Um, and I think that really points to a gap in services that, that exist. Um, so despite all of this data, you see this lead. And yet, um, when we launched, we were uh, there were no programs like ours, and we continue to be the single program in the state that's serving children in grades K through 12. These are all children who've gone through the special education assessment process, have diagnosed emotional or behavioral health needs. Um, and we serve children who've experienced or been exposed to significant traumatic events. Uh, diagnoses include depression, anxiety, mood disorders. Um, and then we also have a program that we launched more recently for children on the autism spectrum or with other neurological disorders who are experiencing behavior challenges and aggressive behaviors in school or in the community. Um, and then we do have a third program I'll talk about uh, that also works with kids in school and community settings. We're able to serve just about 50 children on site, and then we do have a, a small capacity for children who might be on a wait list to enter our program or to move even to a more restrictive, like a residential hospital setting in the community. So as I mentioned, we're a day hospital setting. Um, we're deeply therapeutic and relationships based. So children come to us for the entirety of the day instead of going to their school site. Um, and we're working to make sure that they don't fall behind academically, but really that they're building the skills that they need to be successful in a school setting. So we're doing lots of work on counseling, um, mental health treatment, medication management, et cetera. A lot of the kids who come to us have struggled to even be in a classroom setting or potentially even to attend school. So we're working on some of those basic skills and then building on those over time. We're um, an intentionally interdisciplinary setting. So we combine academic approaches, clinical approaches. We have a very large counseling and therapeutic team as well as medical approaches. So we work with Tulane University School of Medicine. Um, so we have a medical director and psychiatrist who's able to pre prescribe medication on site if families opt for that. Um, 
that's a, the highlight of what we do. Um, and we really have three different core programs. I'm going to start with the one in the center. So our relationships-based day treatment program is the flagship program. It's what we were intentionally launched to fulfill in the city. Um, and this is that very uh, relationships-based, as it says, um, setting where our kids are doing a lot of therapy. There's a lot of opportunities to build relationships with one another, as well as with adults, to practice appropriate behavioral skills, to get intensive intervention, um, as well as academic support. Uh, with the goal of reducing behavior hospitalizations and ultimately returning this group of kids back to a school setting successfully over time. To the right of that, you see a description of our PRISM program for children on the autism spectrum. Uh, this is a newer program. It was launched in response to a number of referrals that we were getting for our relationships-based day treatment program, but for kids with autism spectrum disorder needs um, who required more intensive and a slightly different set of therapeutic supports. So most of the children in that program work either two-on-one, -on -one, adult to child, or one-on-one, -on -one, um, developing their skills. And again, the goal is that they can transition to a less restrictive setting. And last but not least, I want to spend a little bit of time on our play program, which is highlighted in yellow on the left-hand side of the slide. So play, as it says up there, is a stress management and conflict resolution intervention. It was developed by Dr. Howard Stevenson at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, specifically to support African-American youth at risk of or already dealing with behavioral challenges. And one of the things that's unique about it is it actually addresses directly racially stressful and racially traumatic traumatizing situations and helps kids develop skills to navigate those. Um, and it uses sports as a natural venue through which conflict can arise so that kids can experience conflict and then practice the skills that they learn in play. So we adopted this internally at Center for Resilience and saw a lot of success with it. Um, and we now have staffed up our play program so that we have two full-time staff who are also leading play groups in the community in some partner schools and in youth-facing organizations. And the reason I wanna highlight it today is when we're talking about issues of um, youth violence, juvenile crime, et cetera, um, this is a preventative measure. This gives kids the skills to diffuse really stressful situations and make other choices. It's one of the intended outcomes of the program. It's also highly replicable. You do not have to be a licensed therapist or a counselor to lead this. You can be a paraprofessional in a school. You can be a coach. We're actually piloting this at the recreation department now. Um, so as long as you've gone through the training and have gotten some supervision from our team, you're able to implement and lead the play groups yourself. I don't want to skip talking about outcome data. Our program is really expensive. We would not exist if it weren't for the investments of the city council. So thank you for your continued support and for the educational funding that we receive. And we continue to work with the state on enhancing our Medicaid revenue. Um, and I'll never say that we have enough resources, but I do wanna make sure that you see the, the outcomes that we're able to achieve with the revenue we get from you all. Um, so over time, 83% of the children who have been in our program have successfully transitioned back to their setting school, their sending school, when they've been discharged and completed the program with us. Really compellingly, over time, we've seen a very significant reduction in the instances of hospitalizations for short-term behavioral health crises. This is both a cost savings to the city and the state, but also, um, I think, a testament to the wellness of the children we're working with. And we've seen reductions in crises on site at our, our program over time. Um, tellingly, also a lot of our parents report feeling less stressed as a result of the work that we're doing. Our play program that I highlighted a moment ago um, has just finished piloting programs last spring and they're rolling up their data from, from programming that they did this fall in a few of our partner schools. And preliminarily when they've surveyed the students, those students have shared that 100% of them enjoyed being a part of the group group, excuse me, and that the play program helped them reduce stress. 80% of them shared that play helped them make better decisions when they were stressed or frustrated. And 70% said that they felt better about who they are as kids as a result of the programming. The data that we're looking to get from our partner schools is around has play also reduced kids having behavior outbursts at school? Has it increased their attendance, their participation, homework completion, et cetera? 
So I think this data shows that when we invest in youth mental health, we are actually able to make a significant impact. We're a small program serving a small number of children. And of course, we really want to continue to push on expanding more services to more kids. Um, I would call out that the American Academy of Pediatrics and others have basically said that there's a state of emergency in child mental health now. And as a result of the pandemic, many of you know, we're seeing an increase in the rates of suicide among children and adolescents. We're seeing a lot of stress and trauma in families, communities, and certainly our kids are feeling that. Um, so I do want to just publicly recognize the work that Councilmember Jeruso um, and the United Way of Southeast Louisiana have begun around a mental health collaborative. There are a lot of opportunities to keep this work going. And just, you know, from my perspective, I see a number of priority areas around enhancing some of the outpatient intensive services. We're missing many of them, such as multi-systemic therapy, which can support kids who may otherwise make choices to engage in criminal activity. We're in desperate need of a psychiatric residential treatment hospital in our parish. We do not have one. We have a lot of families who we might make this recommendation for, and they won't approve it for their child who needs it because it's not here and they can't get to the North Shore and they can't get to North Louisiana. Um, we need a single point of entry where we can assess what may be happening with a child. Our services are fragmented, so we don't always know where to send families and schools who would like a child to get assessed and connected to services. Um, we certainly need some transitional programming when kids are returning from a hospital facility um, or when they're returning from somewhere where they've been placed and we want to make sure we're setting them up for success and, and identifying the next appropriate placement for them. And it's not up there, but I think we also really need a, a therapeutic group home. The revenue just isn't there from the state to make this a uh, reality right now. But we have a lot of families who articulate concerns about their child's safety in the community and their ability to keep them safe. Um, and rather than, you know, a, a psychiatric hospital, there's the option to have a group home where kids can visit families on the weekend or after hours, uh, but they do have a secure um, residential living arrangement that's that's stable for them. So thank you again for this opportunity. I appreciate your time. Sure. No I'll problem. hand it over to you. Councilmember Teresa. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to say, Liz, thank you for the presentation. Also, the outcome data is just phenomenal. Uh, and I think it speaks a lot to what happens when you spend money. I mean, I know we all spend so much time in here talking about investing front end, but to see numbers way over 50% and some that are super majority from 70, 80%, 83% speaks to what happens when we invest early and the importance of that. And then the second thing is, as I'm looking at your last slide, and I know you mean in a much broader sense, but single point of entry for mental health assessment, and you and I talked about this just the other day, um, two things. One is um, when we were in DC, we met with Senator Cassidy's office, and I know he and Congressman Carter are both trying to work on granting programs to have more people enter into mental health as a profession and, and to pay for college and, and post-degree work. So important that is. But then secondly, as we're talking about trying to get money for public schools, the Senator's office was unaware of the decentralization of the public schools in New Orleans. Right. And so while we've been talking behind the scenes about a single point of contact, they didn't even realize that one of the most important systems was so fragmented and urged us to have it. Now, you're obviously talking about even a much broader context here, but I, I just I, I don't think we can reiterate that point enough that single point of contact, seeing kids through, making sure nothing slips through the cracks is so important. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. I have a question. What is the cost associated with, with the, if a parent wants to sign a child up, uh, what's the cost with that? Is it, are you saying Medicare or Medicaid? What if they don't qualify for that? There's no cost to our families. That's something that we're adamant about. So all of our services from door-to-door -door transportation, food service, enrichment activities are all paid for Um for families. When we look nationwide at the average cost for programs like ours, they tend to average between eighty dollars to $100,000 a year without psychiatry and without transportation, um, which is actually one of our biggest costs. So the average annual cost right now for our program is a little over $100,000 per child. And most of the revenue that we get to support that comes from education dollars. So both the contract that we have with NOLA Public Schools using the Harris dollars, um, 
um, and then direct contracts with each of our referring uh, partner local education agencies, whether it's a district or whether it's a charter school. Um, we just, as I mentioned, have negotiated a daily rate with Medicaid. We're not seeing that revenue yet, but we think that that's going to increase our Medicaid revenue from about 3% of our operating budget currently to about 25% of our operating budget. That's obviously really significant. And then the remaining um, approximately 20% of our operating budget currently we fundraise for. Well, I think um, we have a good program going at our last, uh, one of our last council meetings, a, a lady stood up made a passionate plea for, I think it was Noah, New Orleans. Uh, it was a mental hospital for you. She said it saved her life, um, but it was, no, it was no longer around. And I know you're not a mental hospital, but you provide some of the, some similar services. So I think the more people that know about your program and your services, and that is free, um, they can start to utilize that. So I, I will definitely um, share your information with a lot of people who contact our office looking for uh, mental health for their children. So that, that I, think, I think the ultimate goal is that this can help reduce some of our ills in our city, some of our from criminal behavior or so that that's all stuff as a child and doesn't get addressed and ends up growing as, a, as an adult. So thank you for your presentation. Any other comments from the dais? None? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, next, we have uh, Mrs. Gao. And uh, just want to give everybody a reminder, we are here promoting our small businesses, promoting the, the talent in our city. We don't have to go far to get great services, to get great anything and, and great snacks <laughs> uh, so very sweet so um this guy the floor is yours tell us a little bit about your company and your, how you started and um, what you're doing yourself okay so good morning everyone my name is nadia gal as freddie king stated i am owner of flavor creation cookies which is a hobby turned business in 2020 during the pandemic um we started just baking christmas cookies and kids for our families as a fun activity. Um, started inviting friends over and it was a, oh, this is a delicious cookie. You know, they always look cute, but they don't taste very well. Um, so after that Mardi Gras, which started it off, we partnered with some organizations to promote our cookie kits and have Mardi Gras cookie decorating parties. From there, we went on to doing personalized cookies for birthday parties, baby showers, weddings. Um, we've partnered with some local attorneys to do Christmas parties and decorating uh, kits at their events. We have done decorative cookies for churches, schools. In our short time, we have done summer camps. And within that year, we became a licensed and registered cottage baker. Um, some of you may not know, but a cottage baker is a person that is allowed to bake goods in their home. So from there, we just grew and expanded. Um, we have partnered with universities here, parents from out of town who want to send birthday cookies to their students in colleges. We've done balls, just mind blowing, you know, within the two years. Of course, this is had to bring samples. So the new thing now, like everyone knows, is social media. So now you can promote your business on a cookie is our new thing. Uh, this year, we're kind of expanding to cakes, macaroons, and just reaching out to our community to promote our business in a sweet way. That's <laughs> We'll, we'll do this. We'll, we'll put a pin in that. Uh, I know the police chief has to to make a an exit. So if you could come in and speak about the ordinance that was passed a short while ago. That'd be great, Chief. Chief, thank you so much for for coming, and uh, I appreciate you working with uh, my office on the business business ordinance and, and as another potential tool to give uh, the NOPD and finding uh, solutions to the crime problem we're dealing with. I think um, these kind of ordinances are absolutely necessary because when sometimes when you have a business um, that is there's a lot of nuisance um, things going on around it. It's really hard to um, 
stop it, close that business down, see what's going on in there. So I think this ordinance is great. It cuts out some of the red red tape. So if there's a lot of uh, drug um, sales or violent crimes that are happening at that business, definitely um, can get a handle on it, try to talk to the business, try to work with them. But if nothing, if all else fails, we can actually shut those businesses down, you know, to stop some of the crime in our city. So I think it's absolutely necessary. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate, appreciate you bringing it to my attention and hey, I talk about it. So it's a great ordinance and, and I, um, I'm glad that you guys voted for it. It's great. It's going to be um, really a good tool for us. Thank you, Chief. Um, I, I appreciate um, you being here um, and it passed unanimously. So, so, so far great. we're in good shape. <laughs> good. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm sorry. I have, I have, have a, interrupt. a quick question. Sure. Uh, what do you, what do we do about those businesses where there's a lot of laudering, but there's necessarily no trespasses or no laudering signs, mm -hmm. but people just hang all day, all night. And the owner seems to be fine with it. I think that's another way that through this, um, that, that it passed, I think that's another way into that, you know, go and have people go into those businesses, whether it's our quality of life officer, go to those businesses and hey, it's incumbent upon you to make sure nobody's laudering or, or trespassing around your business. If they are, if you need police assistance, please call us. And that that's a way to segue into, is there um, drug sales going on over there? A way to stop some of the violent crime that may be happening there. So I think um, uh, it's really important that we start talking to our um, the business owners in our community and have them do their part um, in this fight against um, violent crime. Thank you, Chief. Any other Welcome. comments, questions? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Flavor, uh, Ms. Nadia with Flavor, uh, Flavor Creations? Yes. I'm not sure this. You, you keep saying we. Mm -hmm. Who is the other we? My husband. So he's actually a personal chef. He started Flavor Creations in 2009. We, and I say we because we both made the decision for me to quit my full-time job, which was an accountant at Xavier University, and focus on our cookies when I was only getting two hours of sleep trying to juggle both full-time job and cookie business. Um, that's why I said it went from hobby to business really quickly. Um, so that that's why it's a we. You know, you never do anything without your partner because you need that support and backing. That's what I wanted to to get that is it's, it's it's a uh, partnership. Uh, yeah. Husband, well, husband and wife, absolutely. So I think this is great. Um, we have, uh, and, you, and you're located in the east, correct? Yes, sir. New Orleans East. This district East business being represented. You gave up your full time job. You have young children, and you, you're you're chasing your passion, your goal, and it started out of the pandemic. Yes. So a couple think. of good things came out of wow. out of the people had a lot of time on their hands and. Yeah. A lot of business started. Um, so I, I thank you for making your presentation. Do you have any comments or questions from anybody on the day? It's none. Um, so I got some bags. Yes, we have some sweets what, what to we, share. Is that the uh, social media cards? It is. So actually, you can do, this is our QR code on there for Instagram. You can um, also have our Facebook. We've partnered with some local businesses, like I said, who wanted to use the cookie as marketing, opposed to a flyer that people typically just throw away. So we printed their flyer on a cookie, mailed it out for them to their um, mailing list. You know, just new innovative ways of growing businesses in the 21st century since everything is social media based. Absolutely, absolutely. You had a question? I was just going to want, I wanted to make sure that everyone saw that there was a QR code on that. Computer. Like that is impressive. Right. It's, it's, very, very it's there. It works. You can scan it and it comes <laughs> up. And then in the box, of course, we have a Mardi Gras king cake and then our traditional chocolate chip cookies that we um, offer in platters and things for um, corporate parties, home bakes, just different goods. Well, I'll, I'll be sure to... Uh to share as many people as I can, as, that I can. And hopefully, you know, we got a couple other businesses right to your left and to your right. Y'all can yeah. partner up and try to try to make something happen. 
Uh, we have a, a yes, I'm, children. I'm definitely looking forward to some nice guy cookies. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's a perfect way to segue. Any, any other comments? Or? No, just I, I, okay, forward so to our cookies. Cookies and what else? Just so you can um, so our main thing is cookies, decorative cookies and our traditional cookies. However, the past year we've tapped into macaroons, which have taken off. So, so far during this Mardi Gras season, our king cake macaroons and Mardi Gras decorative cookies is our big sellers. Um, we took a cake decorating class, so we're starting to offer cakes. So we're, we're really expanding, but of course, when it's, you know, one person, small business, you have to kind of build your way up to getting there and having, you know, the time and resources to make everything fit in this one business. And I, I just want to highlight once again that you quit your full-time job with your benefits and yeah. study twice a week, uh, <laughs> twice a month check. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I'm but... sure, I'm sure the, the, the parents was encouraging that. Yes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I know when I quit my job to focus on my business, my mom was like, what are you doing? You got well, you know, my mom and grandmother has always baked. So when I said I was doing it and then with the support of my husband, it was just like, go for it. If that's what you feel you want to do. So, you know, they, they questioned it, but once again, supported it. And that's, I think, another reason why our, our business has grown so much in a short time because of the support and the backing. That's definitely important. That's definitely important. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the cost? Um, average, our cookies are $55 a dozen. The more detailed, such as weddings, because of course a lot of florals and things, it can get up to $85 a dozen. Our traditional cookies are $25 a dozen. And then it varies depending on platter, different events. Um, We've partnered, like I said, with local universities, Tulane University being one of them. And did a ball with them. So it was 1,500 cookies. So it, it just varies depending on- A lot of cookies for two people. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's worth it. Like they say, when you enjoy it, it's not so much of a job. It's a passion. Absolutely. You know? So uh, we, not nice guys said so they want some cookies. So we'll segue <laughs> to our district B, uh, our district B company, uh, Nice Guys. Floor is yours. Nice to meet y'all. Nice to be here. Uh, my name is Glenn Charles. This is my wife and partner with Nice Guys Nola. We are more of a Creole fusion restaurant located on Earhart, uh, right off Carrollton. Uh, we opened two years ago, uh, mid-2020, mid and uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. And it was tough. We was actually supposed to open beginning of the year, but we had to hold off because of the pandemic. So we just... Went fishing. <laughs> Went fishing. <laughs> and uh when we got back, we uh we we just said let's go for it. We opened up and it was just me and my wife and two other employees. Uh but now we've grown to over 75 employees. Uh we're doing really well. We uh we uh we cater to a lot of tourism. A lot of people come from out of town, uh bus loads. We have one of the biggest brunches in uh, the South, probably, probably uh, the United States. <laughs> we, we, we do a lot of people. We serve over a thousand people uh, a day. Um, we're growing. We, uh, we love what we're doing. We, and we definitely appreciate what y'all are doing here today because uh, we, we hold a lot of meetings with our neighbor, neighboring businesses, neighbors trying to uh, get rid of the the stipulation of high crime in the area. Uh, we do a lot of things cleaning up at our own expense, neutral grounds, uh, houses that have been blighted and abandoned. Uh, we, we do a lot of things in the area to try and help out the community. We want to kind of bring Earhart up to bring new, new businesses there, uh, other restaurants to try and make the area better. So we definitely appreciate what you guys are doing. Absolutely. Look, I, I went to the spot uh, on Earhart for the first time since my my young days. When I used to uh, it used to be a pool hall, I believe. Right? Yeah, I was kind of dating myself, but I, I just kind of right. hang up in there a little bit. And I, I went to the, huh? Was it thirty seven? 
<laughs> um, still a long time ago. But um, I was shocked. It was a brunch. And I saw the line. I'm like, this, this can't be the right place. I'm, right. I'm going to meet some friends for a quick little bite to eat. And the line was around the corner. It was jamming. And it was raining. <laughs> so it was y'all was y'all was jumping like uh it was very nice and job myself so what kind of um look this is this is constantly harris she she invited you all um so let give her her the shout out she made sure that y'all was the first one i'll let her <laughs> ask the questions that this the business in her her district no i just i just want to thank you all for everything that you do it is one of the best most fun brunches in the city <laughs> Um, I enjoyed myself immensely when I went and I would encourage people to come check you out, not only for brunch, but also I think you're open for lunch and dinner. Are you open for breakfast as well? No. Lunch and dinner. Yes. And then I think at some point y'all are talking about expansion. Yes, we have a second location we opening up uh, probably in the summer. Which it's district? Gonna... Yours. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on Canal Street right across from... Uh... Uh, the VA, yeah, perfect. and that's the concept is going to be basically a, a breakfast restaurant. But uh, yeah, we look, we definitely looking forward to that one. That that one, I think we're going to do a couple of those. Awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm really proud of you. It's you know again highlighting small businesses that are homegrown. Um, you know, young people doing good things. I think we need to talk more about that. Um, and so thank you, Council Member King, uh, for having this meeting. I think it's critical that we continue to do this and that the media here is reporting on all the awesome things that you're doing, including cleanups, which near and dear to my heart, Council Member Green as well. Um, so anything we can do to support, including getting that street fixed on Earhart, which is yep. a mess, um, <laughs> we'll press for that. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank all for what y'all do. Any other questions about Councilman Green? I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you all for your investment, um, your resources and your time. Um, I'm pleased to have served as the head of small and emerging business development for the city some time ago, a couple of decades ago, but I've had a chance to see our economy grow because of entrepreneurs such as yourself who took a risk. I once left a job and decided I was going to go into the business that I'm in now, Nationwide, well, my property management company. Um, I can say a nationwide real estate corporation. I'm always afraid somebody's going to say, you're promoting your own business. For 33 years, I've been self-employed in addition to being able to work with government. But the bottom line is that I, a lot of people have said over the years, oh, y'all don't have enough Fortune 500 companies. We don't need them. Our unemployment rate is as low as in any other city in the nation right now. And we have people such as you who are investing in locations outside of our central business district. And the CBD is fine, but I'm just saying, just an example on Earhart. So I just want to thank you all for your investment and to tell you that, honestly, it makes a tremendous difference in our city that entrepreneurs take the time and put their money and time into businesses. We don't need Fortune 500 companies, and they're not going to relocate here overnight. The bottom line is that we can build some very successful businesses here, as you all are doing, already talking about expansion. Congratulations. And I look forward to using that QR code and ordering some cookies from you. What a creative idea. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your work. Thank, Thank you. you. And where are you all expanding to? Um, where y'all going to expand? Canal Street. Oh, I thought you said now, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> Well, look, uh, I was informed to remind our council that we share our cookies with our staff due to uh, ethics, ethics violation, ethics rules. So we'll make sure the staff uh, gets gets to enjoy the cookies as well. Um, so another comments or the questions, that's it for this presentation. I appreciate y'all coming through. Again, we're going to do this. Hopefully once a quarter, we'll invite different small businesses from different districts to promote themselves and show the talent that we have in the city. We'll quit before our next presentation. Let's, let's all quick jump down and get a quick pitch with our yeah. um, <laughs> entrepreneurs, and then we'll go on to finish the picture. The next presentation. <laughs> Y'all come on. <laughs> and hopefully some of our media members that's here pull y'all to the side and talk to y'all.
You're in charge of yelling one more. Thank you. I said nice cook. Okay. <laughs> Don't remember who said it. Liz, is that yours? Yeah, that's Dean's down there. Moving along, making good time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So next we have, we're going to discuss resolution 1316 by Councilmember Morrell and myself. It's a resolution establishing a working group to develop a comprehensive plan to address truancy and juvenile curfew violations. We do have Ms. Rome. Oh, Ms. Rome. Ms. Rome. Oh, Ms. Rome. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Miss Miss Rome, uh, she's going to give us thank you a quick presentation or just a discussion, uh, representing the Louisiana Louisiana Center for Children's, Children's Rights. Rights. I, I want to make sure you was on your toes. <laughs> All right, but now we have a serious uh, topic discussing our our children, and um, there's an amendment to the resolution made by Council Member Morrell. Um, so I'll I'll give him the floor and discuss the, the resolution as well as the, as the amendment, and then Ms. Rome, you can um, have the floor to discuss your point of view and some data, data driven things that help us reduce our juvenile crime, and also um, that it's a very small population of you uh, of you committing these crimes. So, Councilman Morrell, then Ms. Christian Rome. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're talking about resolution R2316. This is a resolution to establish a working group to develop a comprehensive plan to address truancy and curf juvenile curfew violations, conversations with the New Orleans School Board, as well as the NOPD. We have an amendment which is being shared right now, which is going to strike the juvenile curfew language to focus purely on truancy. Uh, the challenge is, is that we simply do not have the manpower or resources currently to adequately staff a curfew center, which would be necessary for this to work as it historically has worked in the past. With the manpower issues with NOPD, it would be very difficult to have NOPD officers tasked with taking individuals who are picked up for curfew violations to bring them to a properly staffed curfew violation center with the appropriate resources allocate to it. Additionally, I think there needs to be more community driven conversations on what a curfew is and how we expect to enforce it. From my perspective, I never saw a curfew as punitive. I saw it as a preventative mechanism to get kids out of bad situations. At the end of the day, as a parent of a 14 year old, a 12 year old, and a six year old, uh, I can tell you that if my 14 year old was 
out at 11 p.m. at night, I would serve. I would much rather have you at a curfew center than somewhere else. And that's from me, from my perspective. But that being said, having spoken to a variety of people, I think that that needs to be baked far more before it's pushed forward as a item that the city is going to invest in. That being said, uh, Councilman King and I spent a tremendous amount of time last year and this year meeting with schools talking about truancy. Truancy is a significant problem across all of our schools and truancy numbers have been up since COVID. And though they have stabilized at some point, many children are not in school when they should be in school. Um, it is beyond debate that the safest place for a kid to be during the course of a school day is in school and not somewhere else. In fact, it is legally required of those of a certain age should be in school. And I think that investing resources, working with both the school board, the president, the board, the superintendent, the executive director of the mayor's office of youth and families and the youth master plan coordinator to establish how we can pull resources to make sure kids are in school is worthy of our attention and worthy of a collaborative effort. So there is an amendment because of the nature of the way uh, the council operates. We cannot amend bills in committee, but the amendment will be circulated and removes all references to juvenile curfew violations. That's what the amendment does, though it cannot be considered today. Thank you, uh, Council Member Morrell. And I just want to mention something stated at one of the last council meetings was that by the city being 100% uh, charter, different schools let out at different times. So it's very difficult to know who's in school, who's out of school. Uh, you live in you live, you live in allergies, but you go to school in the, in the, in the lower ninth ward. You live in the lower ninth ward, but you go to the main and uptown. It's very difficult to pinpoint where do you belong at what time. So that may be a more more of a conversation for the school board. See if they could come close to putting everybody under one umbrella. That kind of makes sense. But uh, I'm not on the school board, so I'll ask them that they uh, maybe come present that to the to the committee one day. But Ms. Rome, the, the floor is yours. Discussing uh, although we took the, the curfew part out, I think that's still something that needs to be talked about. And if you have any ideas on truancy from your uh, vantage point. To, to make the city a bit safer and a bit better for you, please, for yours. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm Kristen Rome, co-executive director of Louisiana Center for Children's Rights. Um, I'm here with Ashley Hill Hamilton, who's um, our new policy manager. And so um, she's here just to, to see what we're working on. Um, but I appreciate, thank you, um, Council Member Morrell and Council Member King. I appreciate Council Members King, um, comments on truancy that's important that we know that everyone is on the same schedule so we know where everyone belongs on what days and time that's a big part of um, truancy and I wanted to speak a little bit about curfew enforcement I won't say a whole lot because I do appreciate that it's been um, taken off because one huge issue is NOPD's capacity to enforce curfew. Um, but, but I do want to say a, a little bit about curfew. And um, I start, I think most of you know what we do at LCCR, but I'll remind you that we're a youth serving organization. We serve youth throughout Louisiana who are involved in the juvenile legal system as well as the adult criminal legal system. And in New Orleans, our function is we serve as the juvenile public defender. So, um, a large majority of children who are arrested in New Orleans come through our office. Um, and our primary goal is always to ensure that a child is able to leave the juvenile legal system and the criminal legal system and leave it for good. We seek to get them out of the system, but but our, our goal is also to make sure that they re-enter their communities and that they're able to thrive in their communities. And we know that if communities aren't safe, that young people can't thrive in their communities. So public safety is a really big issue for us. And I wanna acknowledge that violent crime is a very serious issue. And it's one that is gonna require some really serious solutions that are backed by data. And what the data shows us, national data, as well as what we've seen here in New Orleans, when even since 
um, my colleague Ashley and I were discussing, even since we were teenagers, curfews have been enacted and enforced in New Orleans. And here we are still talking about the same thing. So anecdotes show us that the curfews don't curb crime, but also there's a significant body of research that shows us that curfews do nothing and they are completely ineffective in reducing crime. And so um, I want to I want to share with the council and encourage the council to think through that and recognize that not only are they ineffective, but they have the potential to be harmful. And they have the potential to be harmful in, in, a, in a couple ways. One, and I think was really important in this moment to address is they further strain relationships between black youth and police officers. And they do that because it allows police officers to arbitrarily judge someone's age and stop a person for that reason. So council member Morrell said that if his 14 year old was out, he would prefer that his 14 year old at 11 p.m. be in a curfew center than out on the street. And that piece of it may be true, but the piece that we miss is that before that child can get to the safety of a curfew center, they have to interact with the police. And what we know, not just based on opinion or anecdotes, but based on fact and data, is that when Black children, Black people, period, interact with police, what we are seeing in our nation and in our city is that it oftentimes ends not well. And so our children see that, they are a part of that, and being stopped by the police for doing absolutely nothing other than being outside, which is normal teenage behavior, whether you know, we agree with it or not, because I was a teenager once and I liked to hang out at night too. Um, it's normal teenager behavior. And so being stopped by the police for doing something completely normal with your friends further strains that relationship. And at this moment, I think it's incumbent upon the council to hear from our young people about what they need to feel safe in their communities. And, and I don't think it includes just being stopped by the police arbitrarily. Um, another thing that I just want to highlight quickly to this council is that while curfews aren't necessarily something new, they are something that gained popularity in the 90s um, during the Clinton administration, during the time of the super predator myth. And so we know that the use of curfews and curfew enforcement is grounded in racism and is grounded in science that has been disproven, uh, inaccurate science. And so at that time, um, the super predator myth in the report purported to find, quote unquote, evidence that juveniles are doing homicidal violence and wolf packs. And that hysteria called for an abrupt shift in how we treated children in the, in the criminal legal system. And we moved from restorative approaches to tough on crime approaches. And since the 90s, we have continued that. We've continued to arrest children. We've continued to try children as adults. We've continued to be tough on crime when it comes to children. And none of those things have helped to reduce crime. And so today we know that the, the uptick in crime in the 90s was due to crack being pumped into the Black community. And so it's incumbent upon us now, instead of just being reactionary, to figure out what is happening. Why is this happening? What does the data tell us? Who's being arrested? Where are they being arrested? For what are they being arrested? How many times have they been arrested? So that we can begin to figure out what data-driven solutions will work to reduce crime, because curfew does not work to reduce crime. So um, I think, you know, I won't go on and on, but I, I do want to just encourage um, all of you to engage with the Youth Master Plan's safety and justice pillar that includes some solutions, as well as the Youth Justice Advocates um, platform for youth justice, which also gives some solutions that are um, that are grounded in what our young people have told us that they want. And then I just encourage us to, as, as we hear calls from the public to do something about what is very serious, that we do something that works and that we don't just double down in doing what we've always been doing that hasn't been working with the expectation that something will change. The stakes are far too high here, particularly as it relates to our young people, to not question why we continue to reignite the same failed policies when, when there are calls to action. So thank you for your time. Any questions or comments from this? 
I mean, honestly, I, I would actually, I think it's it's a good opportunity for you to talk about some of the things in the youth, youth master plan as some of the solutions. If if you could, you know, list some of those, because I think it would really open us up to have further discussion on some of these solutions in, in other committee meetings. Well, and, and can I add to that? And then also the things the council budgeted this year that are root cause based. As I'm sorry, I can't. I, I'm sorry, my microphone for some reason is lower than everybody else's. Um, also, the things the council budgeted for this year that are root cause based too. That that I guess um, that should be part of the solution because we I think we all agree with you that root cause is important, and we put a lot of money and injected it into that. And so, um, not only maybe where we started and where it needs to expand, but also programs that that work well too. Mm -hmm. So two things that we consistently hear young people say is that they do not want they do not want their peers to be further system involved. They do not want young people to be arrested. That's one of the number one things we always hear them say. We see that both in the youth master plan that asks for more restorative approaches and less interaction with the police, as well as the platform for youth justice. So that's something that we consistently hear. Another thing that we consistently hear that's present in the youth master plan safety and justice um, solutions is young people want mentorship. And so this get, brings me back to my point about data. If we had data, clear data from NOPD, from the DA's office, from the juvenile court, from LCCR, and I want to be clear that when I'm asking for data, I'm, I'm also recognizing and honoring that I don't know what the data will show. I'm not asking for data because I think it will cut in LCCR's favor. I'm asking for data because if we are talking about a crisis here that we need to solve, we need to know what the crisis is. We need to know what percentage of our children are being arrested. My understanding and the numbers that I have show me that of all arrests in New Orleans, 10% of those arrests are children. And so when I ask people what percentage they think that is, the percentage is much higher. We also have been told um, by folks that collect this data that the arrest um, data is pretty representative of the crime data, that, that they go lock and step together. And so it's a good representation. And so getting back to mentorship, if we have data about which children are being arrested, where these children live, how many times these children are being arrested, for what they are being arrested, then we can begin to think through, okay, who are the children who need the services most? Are the programs that we're currently investing in actually reaching those children? Are they actually working with those children? And then we can determine which resources we need to continue to invest in, which resources we need to divest from, and what other things can we be investing in to ensure that young people get what they need? So, Council Member Moreno, I think the two biggest things that we take from the Youth Master Plan is children do not want their peers to have more engagement with police, and they want more mentorship opportunities. Thank you. You're welcome. And Ms. Rome, I think you're very correct. Well, I agree with you. You need more mentors and mentor groups. Um, and a lot of those mentor groups, we heard it previous meeting they're underfunded and for some reason it's, it's too much red tape in, in this city getting the funds allocated to the mentor groups to them uh, it's, it's just way too many hurdles to jump 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 over way too many to jump through we um spoke to a group in Algiers so right now there are very few mentor groups in Algiers that the city partners with and you would think the city would make an effort those who are in decision-making um, leadership role who make an effort to get those groups funded or bring some of the city programs to the West Bank. So I met a kid who was going to a program in Central City mm -hmm. on Jackson, it's Simon Bolivar, and he went to Edna Carr. He lived in Cutoff. So why, and this was uh, maybe September or August of last year. Mm -hmm. And six, seven months later, there are still no programs and on the West Bank, um, we have an open, uh, empty, basically empty Arthur Mundy Center. It's a community center in Algiers that sits vacant with the exception of um, a, a senior center, a senior day center. It sits empty seven days out of the week. Uh, City-owned property, and it's exactly. empty. And we have groups that are saying, we'll help. We, 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 we're doing work, but we could do so much with the funds we get. And it's just so much, so much red tape. And, and it gets them discouraged. 
and they, they lash out, they lash out at us, they lash out at each other. Um, but I think we can can work with your group, your, your organization, to find out where are these groups that are the, the, these pockets where the crime is, is most prevalent amongst our children and get mental groups there and get those mental groups money, we may see a, a, a reduction in our crime. But that has to come from political will. I know everyone on this, this council is willing to do. We had a presentation with the young man's name. He was with, a, it was a ceasefire last week. He was ceasefire and the, and the program was working. Political ideologies, it, it got cut and now crime is back up. So when we see things that work, we need to, to fund those things that work and put political agendas and, and likes and dislikes to the side and fund the groups that's working and put the resources in the neighborhood. I think it's, it's, it's criminal that to this day, there is nothing, no city program on the West Bank, but you have four high schools, you have about five middle schools and there's not one city funded pro. If they're at, they are, please let me know, I stand corrected, but there are none to my knowledge in Algiers. And a few groups that's doing the work in Algiers are severely underfunded. Absolutely. And I would just add to that, the real way for us to see how that lack of investment in Algiers is, a, is a impacting Algiers is with data. So we need to know what is the data in Algiers? Who's, are children being arrested in Algiers? How many children are being arrested in Algiers? For what crimes are they being arrested? During what times are they being arrested? Those children, when they are arrested, how long are they sitting in detention? When they get out of detention, are they being rearrested? Are they being rearrested for new crimes? Are they being rearrested for the same crimes? But we begin to understand what is happening in our community when we when we know what the data shows us. And I think far too often, what I am seeing in this city, far too often is that we are talking a lot um, in a reactionary way, we're reacting to what is happening. We are all frustrated. We all want to live somewhere that's safe. We all feel discouraged, including our young people. And so this is a marathon, not a sprint. We're not going to resolve this tomorrow. We're not going to resolve this by putting band-aids on issues. We're going to resolve this by really taking a real look at what is happening, understanding what is happening, and then getting the knowledge that we need from young people, from other cities, from what the data shows us to create long-term solutions. I agree. Any other comments? I, I'd like a final comment. I want to be very clear, and I think we have a distinct difference of perspective when it comes to curfew. For me, curfews are about parental accountability. I think that as a parent, you have a responsibility to know where your kid's at. I appreciate that there is a conflation between juvenile arrests for petty crimes and harassment and from my perspective, juvenile safety. When you look at the last four months, over half the instances in which an individual, a child was injured or killed, teenagers was after curfew. For me, when I think about my kids, when I think about my nephews, my nieces, my cousins, my neighbors, everyone across the city, the people who I trust that call me and ask me about curfews are parents of children who think it is unsafe for their children to be out at night. To be clear, this city is not safe for anyone, juvenile or adult. But as a parent, we have a responsibility to look out for our kids. And the reality is that children think they're invincible. That is part of the nature of being a, a, being a teenager and being a young adult. You think you're invincible and that you will not become a statistic. When I was with Councilmember King at Carr a month ago, dealing with a school in mourning with someone I believe, uh, Councilman King was a recent graduate with a 4.2 average who got shot at a house party it's not safe to be out, period. But if there is a possibility that we can discourage young people from being out on the street and being in harm's way, that is my perspective what a curfew is. The reason why I'm not moving forward today is because without a fully robust plan as to what a curfew center looks like that is staffed with people to provide resources, 
to kids to find out why in the hell is a 14 year old out at 2 a.m. in the morning. If you don't have a fully staffed center that is providing robust resources to find out the reason and the wherewithal and what is happening, the lack of oversight, why that kid's out there, then it's not worth doing. Because if you don't have the properly staffed curfew center with all the resources and the mission to interact and interface with youth and their families to get to the root of the problem, it just turns into juvenile detention, which is not something anyone here is seeking. We don't want some kids stuck in a juvenile detention center because they were out at night. What we do want is if you're a 14 year old at 2 a.m. in the morning, you need to be brought somewhere where your parents have to come out of your guardian and explain, how did you get out here and how can we avoid this in the future? In a lot of ways, I see from my perspective, what I perceive, what I perceive curfew as is more like truancy, which is a child is put in a very bad situation because of the circumstances in which they're growing up and they're living in, typically a lack of resources and how do we resource them. But at the same time, I do, like I said, I want to give my perspective on this. And the reason why I started with my son is if my 14 year old were out in this city after curfew, hell, it's not like it's 9 p.m. on a weeknight. If my kid were out on the street at 9 p.m. in this city right now, I would be terrified. If I went in his room and he wasn't there, I wouldn't even be thinking about criminality. I'd be thinking it is not safe to be on the streets for adults or children. But I think it's the responsibility of parents and guardians, especially to impart to children. You should not be out right now because this city is dangerous. It is dangerous for everyone. Now, there are a variety of different things that we need to do as a city to make the city safer. But in the interim, we have to triage. And when I look at, I mean, on the fifth of this year, we had a team dropped off an emergency room at 2.20 at a.m. in the morning who died. In December, we had two 19-year-olds killed, 17, 18-year-old wounded, driven to a hospital by a private motor carriage. I mean, this is reality right now in the city. It's not the fault of children. To your point, I've worked with LCCR my entire career. Children are a very small amount of those charged with crime, and they're disproportionately blamed for it. But that being said, we as a city should do everything possible to keep our kids out of harm's way. So I hope as we put aside curfew for the extended future, we can work on what it looks like to resource kids to keep them from being out at night, to give them what they need so that they're not roaming the streets looking for it. And more importantly, to really push accountability upon the adults, not the children themselves. Because I will tell you, both with this bill and the ordinance we have dealing with charging adults who leave firearms in the reach of children who then take them to school or take them out the house, it's about adults being accountable for what they have control over, not blaming and tasking children because they're kids. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And I would just tell you, I'm also a parent. My colleague Ashley is a parent of a, of a teenager. I'm not a parent of a teenager, but she's a parent of a teenager. Um, so certainly we, we agree. We want our children to be safe. I will just again say that curfews don't curb violence. And so we want violence to stop. We want violence to go down, but but curf curfew is not the way to do that. But we certainly want ways for children to get what they need, no matter the time of day. And if we, if if part of the, the potential curfew center is ensuring that young, we understand what's happening with young people and we make sure that they get the resources that they need, no matter the time of the day, we're in support of young people getting the resources that they need always. I would move we pass this. We're going to amend it, obviously, at the council because we can't amend the committee, but I would move that we pass this resolution of the full council for a vote, not on consent, because it has to be amended to take the curfew language out. So, but yeah, move the council. One thing about board. It's a resolution. All right. Well, that is it. Any other comments, questions? We have uh, one online comment. We have an online comment. Thank you. This is from Winston Boom Witten, Jr. He says, what efforts are being made to attract businesses to New Orleans that would provide salaries that would allow for sustainable households to be cultivated? 
In this manner, adults would not be forced to opt for menial work opportunities, leaving those job positions available for teen and young adult workers. This can lead to the frequency of truancy and curfew violations to decrease. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neal. So at this time, make a motion to adjourn. No votes, right? Uh, second, motion made by Councilmember Moreno, second by Councilmember Farrell. Five yeas, no nays. Needs adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.